so the recording has started. As we start the session this afternoon on gender responsive disaster risk management, I'd want us to start with uh, the session with open remarks from Mr. Itonde Kakoma, the IFRC head of delegation and permanent representative to the African Union and international organizations. So I will welcome Mr. Itonde to take the floor and give us the open remarks. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleague Milanoi, and good afternoon, colleagues Milanoi. If you could confirm that you can That's hear me same. loud and clear. Can you confirm you can hear me? We can't hear you. Can you hear Mr. Itonde anyone? I can hear you. We can, can you? hear him. Can you? Rubin, please help. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. You can hear Very you. good. Very good. Thank you, Milanoi, for that confirmation, correct? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Very, very good. Good afternoon, colleagues, and uh, really a, a warm word of welcome on my part uh, from the IFRC, Permanent Representation Office to the African Union and International Organizations here in Addis. Thank you for joining us and to the organizers of this Africa Regional Platform for DRR organized by the African Union Commission, EGAD, and UNDRR. Uh, we are extremely pleased as the Federation to be holding this event to discuss gender responsive DRM with distinguished colleagues, particularly from Madagascar and Zimbabwe today. Now, as it pertains to the increase in natural disasters from climate change, and the exacerbations of COVID-19 pandemic, there are at least two points of which I wish to bring to your attention. Firstly, globally, natural disasters are occurring more frequently, primarily due to climate change, leading to an increasing number of weather-related emergencies, as highlighted in the World Disasters Report of 2020. Now, similarly, Across Africa, as highlighted by the World Meteorological Institute and the impact of climate change in Africa, this is reflected in higher temperatures, rising sea levels, and coastal erosion, as well as changes in rainfall. Now, more apt to the conversation today, gendered impacts of disasters on women, girls, and, under, and other marginalized groups. Here's where we would focus, again, globally due to existing gender and social inequality, disasters have disproportionately negatively direct and indirect impacts on women, girls, and other marginalized groups. Furthermore, in Eastern and Southern Africa in particular, where we have the IFRC and UNICEF partnership, the studies have highlighted negative impacts of disasters on women and girls that are rooted in gender inequality, including gender-based violence, and we'll hear more about that today. For example, across the region of Africa, uh, a reduction in girls' school attendance follows a reduction in rainfall, and there are other correlative aspects to this, whereby we see a rise in child marriages following droughts. Further to these two, we have observed an increase in risks to and frequency of gender-based violence following periods of both reduced rainfall and droughts. Now, we also know that globally and specifically in Africa, gender-based violence cases have spiked during the pandemic of COVID-19, particularly within the lockdowns that's experienced throughout many countries. Worldwide, as highlighted by UNICEF in other reports, uh, many countries did not recognize the gender-based violence services as essential at the beginning of the COVID-19 response. And in not recognizing uh, gender-based violence services as essential, this has reduced opportunities for prevention and has led to a lack of support for survivors. Now, this being leading to another question of whether disaster risk management, DRM, legal and policy frameworks are sufficiently including gender considerations for gender-based violence risk mitigation response. 
Now we know in order to do that, in order to address those concerns, partnership is crucial. And to this end, the partnership we are privileged to enjoy with UNICEF as IFRC was born from the recognition that DRM legal and policy frameworks must integrate gender and gender-based violence risk mitigation and response so as to ensure better responsiveness in terms of gender sensitivity in disaster risk management. And now out of this shared interest, UNICEF and IFRC have launched a project beginning at the start of 2020 to support and bolster regional efforts as led by the African Union Commission towards the integration of gender, including gender-based violence considerations for risk mitigation, prevention, and response in DRM. Now, this included trainings conducted by UNICEF and IFRC and national society staff of Red Cross and Red Press and national societies on gender integrated DRM, as well as undertaking studies to assess the extent of integration of gender and gender-based violence considerations in these very DRM legal and policy frameworks. Now, finally, for the study which we launched today and the panel discussion on we are really excited for the launching of this report, assessing the extent of this integration of gender and gender-based violence risk mitigation, prevention and response. We are also very pleased uh, following this uh, to hear from distinguished panelists, uh, notably Lieutenant Colonel Aritiana Fali of the DRN Institute in Madagascar, most welcome, uh, Sally Nkube, coordinator of the Women's Coalition of Zimbabwe, most welcome, and Maurice Taibwa of the East African community, very welcome, so that we can learn from your experiences and efforts and recommendations to strengthen gender responsiveness in DRM. Welcome again, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Itonde, for the great opening for the great office of Marx. It, get, it sets a good tone as we start this conversation on integration of gender in disaster risk management frameworks. So even as we move on, I now want to welcome Anna Myers. Anna Myers is the consultant who led uh, the study on gender responsive disaster risk management. And uh, Anna Myers is a research consultant focused on strengthening gender-based balance and sexual reproductive health programming in emergency preparedness and she has over 10 years of experience in humanitarian and post-conflict settings. Really, thank you, Anna, for the great work. And at this point, I want to welcome Anna to share with us the study findings. Thank you. Welcome, Anna. Welcome. Thank you so much, Illinois, and thank you so much, Mr. Ashande, for uh, such an introduction to follow. Um, it's my honor to present on the study findings of the analysis of gender integration in national and regional risk management. Oh, I see that I'm, one second. Let me share the other slide. Did that work? Pardon. Yes. Um, Great, okay. So as Mr. Otonde said, this study uh, was in recognition that to reduce the disproportionate negative impacts of disasters on women, girls, and other marginalized groups, DRM frameworks must be gender responsive. And the study questions focused on two things. To what extent are they? And what are some of the challenges, facilitators, opportunities, and recommendations that stakeholders working on this have to share? The study consisted of a desk review of 23 DRM legal and policy documents collected across the 10 study countries that you see here, as well as the four continental and regional bodies. That includes AUC, EGAD, SADC, and E. We had consultations as well with 72 UNICEF and IFRC. Oh yeah, of course. Donc, la, la représentante spéciale du secrétaire général des Nations Unies, Madame Rémi Mizotori, serait disposée à avoir une discussion, euh, une réunion virtuelle avec votre ministre demain. Oui, vous m'entendez. Donc, la, 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 la... 
Oui. Avec votre ministre. Voilà. Demain à 10h40. Amélie, euh... éteindrez votre microphone, s'il vous plaît. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so we held 72 consultations with UNICEF and IFRC and National Society colleagues, and then had the pleasure of interviewing 61 key informants. And those included representatives from DRM institutes, uh, ministries of gender and national and international organizations working on gender and GBV risk mitigation prevention and response across the regional and continental bodies and the 10 countries. Uh, when we're talking about, you know, defining the extent of, integra of integration of gender within DRM frameworks, we adapted uh, the WHO gender responsive assessment scale. And so you can see this here. And we'll focus more on uh, gender blind, gender sensitive, and gender responsive. So gender blind is when gender is not considered within the program design. Gender sensitive is when inequalities are recognized. And gender responsive is when actions are taken to address those inequalities to promote equal outcomes. And this is moving towards gender transformative. So the results of the analysis were that of the 23 DRM legal and policy documents, you can see here the difference between overarching gender sensitivity and responsiveness versus the attention to GBV. So 61% of the documents were gender sensitive or responsive. So moving towards more and more actions responding to gender inequalities. And 30% were gender blind. And many of those were more laws. A lot more of the policies and strategies were gender sensitive and responsive. And these are progressively becoming more and more across countries as more countries are doing both gender responsive and disability responsive frameworks. The attention to GBV was uh, less as you can see here. So 13% were GBV sensitive or responses, responsive, whereas 83% were GBV blind. So really highlighting an opportunity uh, to bring more attention to GBV risk mitigation, prevention and response in DRM. The areas of integration that uh, different countries are integrating gender into for their frameworks, as well as those implementation of frameworks uh, are quite widespread, as you can see. So ideally, um, you would see gender integration at every stage and multiple countries were doing this. And this would be the same for implementation of ensuring those gender considerations, including actions uh, to address risks of GBV would be taken at all stages of the framework and all stages of implementation. So stakeholders spoke of numerous challenges, facilitators, opportunities, and recommendations in developing and implementing gender responsive DRM frameworks. And we're just gonna share a few uh, today, but there's quite a bit more in the report and specific countries' works are detailed as well in the report. So some of the challenges, competing priorities and limited staff resources and time led to gender considerations being more ad hoc or thought to be done a little too late. Uh, for those uh, gender focal points who are in DRM institutes or who are working within partner uh, organizations or ministries, they were not leveraged or um, the representation of gender stakeholders were not on national coordinating bodies for DRM. And a stakeholder spoke of the challenge of this when really trying to get representation in uh, the, de the development teams for DRM frameworks. Thirdly, there's limited attention to the collection, use, and sharing of sex and age and disability disaggregated data. Um, and this could be too that their sex and age disaggregated data are not actually mandated in the Sunday monitoring framework. And so it's hard to enforce along with those competing priorities. Some of the facilitators were strong collaboration among stakeholders working on DRM, gender and GBV risk mitigation, prevention and response. And this collaboration really led to uh, the, the enabling of gender responsive DRM frameworks to be developed, along with the prioritization of gender integration by national and subnational DRM stakeholders and supportive regional and national DRM and gender frameworks. And we're gonna speak more to these facilitators in opportunities next. 
So opportunities for gender responsive DRM framework development. So for anyone online who's working um, on drafting or revising a DRM bill or policy, please put into the chat what country you're in. You can see from here a few of the study countries who are currently drafting or revising DRM bill or policies. And this is an incredible opportunity to really make them gender responsive. And those countries that are awaiting adoption of DRM frameworks, some from the study are listed here, but this is spoken of by stakeholders, another good opportunity to check in on the gender integration that's been done. And also for places where the DRM frameworks have expired and people are beginning to get together, it's an opportune time to ensure that the right stakeholders across DRM and gender focused organizations and ministries are there. And as well for gender or GBV prevention and response policies that reference disasters and really speak to the necessity of a continuity of services during disasters. These are great policies nationally to, to reference when advocate, advocating for more gender responsive DRM policies. And as well, in the AUC and EGOD strategy, there um, are action items to develop guidance for how to develop gender responsive DRM and CCA framework. So currently global and regional guidance on this doesn't exist, but AUC and EGOD uh, do have it in their strategies and we'll be looking to do that going forward. And this is a wonderful opportunity for the development of gender responsive DRM frameworks along member states. For opportunities and implementation, so DRM institutes can leverage and include the leadership of national and community-led organizations. And Sally will speak more to this in the panel, um, but this was seen, for example, in Burundi, where there is a national GBV response organization that's an implementing partner to the national coordinating body, really highlighting the important role they play at ensuring survivor care all the way down to community levels for DRM. Um, and DRM institutes can foster new partnerships for sex and age and disability disaggregated data. So for example, in Uganda and Kenya, there's new partnerships between ministries and the Bureau of Statistics to really look at this. And the AUC and RECs and member states can utilize quite a number of regional response efforts that are happening and working groups and platforms. So for instance, SADC is having a number of new regional response mechanisms that could be gender responsive. Um, EAC is, uh, has started a GBV working group and AUC has a gender platform. So there's a lot going on that will support the implementation of DRM frameworks that are gender responsive in the region. And recommendations. So looking on the national level, uh, stakeholders spoke to the importance of always considering GBV risk mitigation, prevention and response as a core component of gender integration. And the DRM frameworks can be designed using a participatory process. And this really enables gender and disability responsive uh, DRM frameworks. So for instance, uh, in South Sudan, this was done with the DRM Institute, Institute working in close collaboration with the Ministry of Gender and doing numerous consultations with women's organizations and youth networks on national and subnational levels to ensure that that process really enabled a gender responsive DRM framework in their development. Oh, sorry. And to institutionalize gender responsive DRM. So we'll hear a lot more about how Madagascar is doing this in the panel. But for example, in Mozambique, they have a gender strategy for the DRM Institute in this effort. And to invest in subnational DRM, recognizing communities as first responders. So for example, in Kenya, they've done a lot of focus on subnational DRM framework development that are, that are participatory and really engaging communities, recognizing their role in responding to disasters and strengthening planning and coordinating among national and subnational stakeholders working on DRM, gender and GBV prevention and response. So this is critical and we'll hear more about this in the panel as well, but really ensuring that close collaboration at all levels between ministries and international and national organizations. And finally, for recommendations on the regional level, stakeholders spoke to ensuring gender responsive DRM initiatives are working across DRR and gender units, as well as DRM institutes and gender ministries in member states. And then many stakeholders as well spoke to the importance of learning from neighboring countries of what they're doing for gender responsive DRM. And uh, it was a recommendation regionally to hold more learning opportunities so they can share. 
um, and invest in the leadership of regional platforms representing women, youth, and other marginalized groups. So on a regional level, there's quite a bit, uh, for example, the Africa Youth Advisory Board, um, and these types of platforms are instrumental in ensuring uh, inclusive gender responsive DRM at regional and national levels. So thank you all so much. This is just a snapshot of the report um, and the findings, but very excited to hear a lot more from the panel and the report link will be available in the chat soon. Over to you all. Thank Thanks, Anna, and thanks for uh, sharing already a great country example and regional example. I hope, participants, that uh, now you want to read the whole report. It's being officially launched now as we speak during the side event, so you have the link and we'll follow up uh, with all of you. So I'm Emmanuel. I'm the regional advisor for gender for UNICEF uh, for Eastern and Southern Africa. And it's a pleasure for me uh, now to introduce our three panelists. Um, first, we will have the pleasure to have with us today Lieutenant Colonel Fali, who is representing the National Disaster Risk Management Institution in Madagascar, the Bureau National de Gestion des Risques et des Catastrophes. A warm welcome to Sally Nkube, the National Coordinator of the Women Coalition of Zimbabwe. And finally, we are very grateful to Maurice Tayeba to join us from um, uh, Tanzania uh, on behalf of the East African uh, community. So let's start with you, Lieutenant Colonel Fabi, and I'm going to shift to French, reminding all of our participants that we have a live translation available. Lieutenant Colonel, tout d'abord, merci pour votre contribution. Uh, okay, I also need to switch to French. Sorry for that. Otherwise, I'm okay. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel, tout d'abord un grand merci pour euh, votre euh, contribution à cette initiative depuis le début et aussi pour prendre le temps d'être avec nous aujourd'hui alors que vous coordonnez actuellement la réponse humanitaire dans le sud de Madagascar. Lieutenant Colonel, est-ce que vous pourriez partager avec nous comment s'est passée l'institutionnalisation de l'intégration du genre au sein du Bureau national de la gestion des risques et catastrophes Et est-ce que cette intégration permet aujourd'hui une meilleure réponse dans la crise que vous gérez actuellement dans le sud du pays euh, Oui, merci beaucoup de nous avoir donné euh, l'honneur de, de faire partie donc, de cet euh, important panel. Euh, Effectivement, donc, Madagascar a commencé à institutionnaliser l'atténuation des risques liés au genre et à la VBG euh, dans la gestion des risques et des catastrophes à travers tout d'abord la stratégie. En effet, la stratégie nationale de gestion des risques et des catastrophes à Madagascar fait mention donc, de l'importance d'incorporer la dimension genre dans la préparation et la réponse au désastre. Il stipule clairement que la SNGRC, ou la Stratégie nationale de gestion des risques et des catastrophes, est étroitement liée au profil des risques et des vulnérabilités de Madagascar et pose comme postulat que les risques naturels sont inévitables, leurs impacts, si les risques naturels sont inévitables, leurs impacts peuvent être atténués grâce à une gestion mieux adaptée en intégrant donc la dimension transversale comme la dimension genre. Ces orientations sont traduites au niveau opérationnel dans les plans de contingence qui sont élaborés et mis à jour annuellement, mais aussi dans les plans de réponse multisectorielle que Madagascar a eu à préparer pour faire face aux multiples crises qui ont affecté le pays, notamment ces deux dernières années. C'est le cas, par exemple, du plan multisectoriel d'urgence à la COVID-19 qui a été élaboré en 2020 et également le plan intégré donc, de réponse lié à l'insécurité alimentaire et la malnutrition aiguë provoquée par la sécheresse au sud de Madagascar actuellement. Par ailleurs, avec la contribution donc, des partenaires et également le leadership du gouvernement, le BNGRC a établi également un plan de relèvement et de résilience comme celui qui a été établi en 2016 pour la réponse d'urgence post-El Nino, dans lequel la dimension genre est pleinement prise en compte dans les axes prioritaires. 
Pour cet effet, le BNGRC a assuré l'implication des groupes sectoriels protection et des acteurs qui œuvrent dans la promotion de l'égalité des genres dans, la pro, dans le processus d'élaboration de ces plans. Tout d'abord, une prise en compte transversale des aspects genre et de médication de risques liés au VBG, exemple dans les abris concernant les promiscuités, les séparations des toilettes, donc euh, dans les abris d'urgence, concernant les différentes dis distributions et transferts, on a fait en sorte de ne laisser personne derrière et donc s'assurer que tous les, euh, toutes les catégories donc de, euh, de ménages vulnérables sont pris en compte, pris en charge. Ensuite, l'identification des cibles et des indicateurs pour le suivi. Lors des, euh, des réponses par rapport au COVID, nous avons par exemple établi un poste euh, disaster monitoring euh, où on a fait donc euh, des enquêtes concernant la satisfaction euh, lors des distributions des transferts monétaires aux ménages. Et à ce titre, par exemple, on a pu apprécier la proportion des ménages déclarant avoir entendu des bénéficiaires se plaindre d'abus ou d'exploitation sexuelle qui s'élève à environ 7,5% dans les neuf dans districts concernés par l'enquête. Et enfin, la sensibilisation des acteurs sectoriels sur l'importance d'assurer que les interventions humanitaires intègrent systématiquement ces éléments et sur la redévabilité collective envers la population bénéficiaire pour minimiser les risques que les urgences les euh, exacerbent les multiples formes de VBG, notamment afin d'éviter qu'il y ait euh, par exemple, certains exemples qu'on a eus dans d'autres pays où euh, des humanitaires demandent des faveurs sexuelles en, en échange donc, des aides humanitaires. Ensuite, on a vraiment fait un effort sur la représentativité et la coordination. Le BNGRC participe activement au groupe sectoriel protection, tant au niveau national qu'au niveau régional. Et en même temps, il y a eu une coordination croisée entre le ministère en charge de la population et de la protection pour les catastrophes. Le BNGRC a été très actif également euh, auprès avec euh, l'UNICEF et le ministère en charge de la population pour donc, le leadership de ce groupe sectoriel. Nous avons mis à jour notre stratégie nationale en mettant un effort sur l'approche par responsabilité sectorielle et le groupe sectoriel protection fait partie prenante donc des groupes sectoriels à Madagascar. La protection de l'enfant en cas de catastrophe, moi-même j'ai été avec l'UNICEF un des formateurs de protection de l'enfant en cas de catastrophe lors donc de ces, des, des différentes initiatives qu'on a déjà fait en 2006-2007 et qu'on a continué ensuite. Un point de force également a été fait pour la continuité et le progressif renforcement de la prise en charge et la prise en compte du genre et de VBG afin de renforcer donc l'effort permanent pour que les staffs du BNGRC, mais aussi les staffs des ministères sectoriels soient sensible à ce thème au niveau national, mais aussi au niveau local. Avec l'appui des partenaires techniques et financiers comme l'UNICEF, le BNGRC a, for, a par exemple formé au moins une vingtaine de son staff en 2020 et à ce jour, en 2021, un bon nombre donc de nos staffs également se préparent à être formés sur euh, le VBG et le PSC dans le sud de Madagascar euh, afin de pouvoir encore améliorer notre implication dans, le, euh, dans le, le, le thématique. Quelques exemples qui ont fait que l'institutionnalisation a bien marché ici à Madagascar. C'est le lien entre l'urgence, 
le relèvement, la résilience et le développement. On sait que le gouvernement fait un effort pour la mise en place d'un certain nombre de centres d'écoute, la mise en place, notamment par exemple euh, lors du Covid, des lignes vertes pour pouvoir capturer les différentes plaintes et, et éventuellement prendre en compte donc, de, des victimes. On s'appuie sur ces structures que le gouvernement met en place à travers donc, le ministère en charge de la population pour pouvoir être un relais en cas d'urgence pour le traitement d'un certain nombre donc, de cas qu'on aurait observés. Il y a aussi la mise en place lors des urgences, des Saharan Yankees, par exemple, qui sont des, euh, des parcs dans lesquels on essaye de euh, fidéliser les enfants qui sont provisoirement déplacés et qui sont victimes, afin qu'ils ne soient pas trop affectés par la situation de détresse dans laquelle se trouverait leur famille. Et enfin, en matière donc, de leçons apprises et de recommandations, à Madagascar, la formulation en cours de la politique nationale de, de, de l'égalité femmes-hommes ouvre une fenêtre d'opportunité pour intégrer davantage les thématiques de protection de femmes et de filles dans les situations d'urgence sur la prise en compte de l'impact des crises sur les égalités de genre, surtout dans le contexte où Madagascar est en première ligne parmi les pays qui font face aux effets au changement climatique sur la population les plus vulnérables. Vous avez vu que lors du COP26, Madagascar a été au centre des préoccupations de certaines discussions qui ont eu lieu par l'exemple criant de la sécheresse dans le Grand Sud qui a conduit aux problématiques d'insécurité alimentaire et de malnutrition aiguë auprès d'un bon nombre de la population dans cette partie-là où je me trouve actuellement du pays. Il y a aussi l'établissement donc de la loi relative à la, à, à, à la lutte contre la violence basée sur le genre, notamment dans son article 13 qui stipule que l'État formule et met en œuvre la politique de lutte contre la violence basée sur le genre et mobilise les ressources nécessaires en la matière. La mise en place de textes législatifs de ce genre démontre un leadership fort du gouvernement qui veut vraiment montrer l'exemple afin qu'il n'y ait pas d'ambiguïté sur les priorités qui sont faites. Par ailleurs, le partenariat entre le ministère en charge de la population et les partenaires techniques et financiers pour assurer que la politique genre adresse les aspects précédemment cités, mais aussi les stratégies et les plans de gestion des risques adresse la mitigation des impacts de crise sur les BBG, reconnaissant les besoins spécifiques des groupes de population et soit formulé d'une manière participative que les femmes et les filles puissent exprimer leur vœu. En outre, la coopération Sud-Sud Madagascar a été un des, un des, des, des pionniers également où le BNGRC avait fait des échanges assez réguliers avec nos amis de NDMA également, de Malawi, de Mozambique, de Sénégal, mais aussi de nos camarades qui sont dans l'océan indien et de la SADEC. On contribue pleinement dans les échanges concernant la thématique de la gestion des risques et des catastrophes d'une manière globale, mais aussi la spécificité de l'intégration du genre dans la stratégie de la SADEC de gestion des risques et des catastrophes. Et enfin, dans le Sud, le déploiement du BNDRC pour coordonner donc, les réponses actuelles et la mise en place d'un sous-cluster au niveau local concernant la protection et un groupe de travail PEAS ici dans le Sud de Madagascar créer un contexte propice pour la continuité de la collaboration sur le terrain et au niveau national afin d'avoir un meilleur impact et une continuité donc et la cohérence dans nos actions. Ce sont, je pense, quelques exemples sur lesquels je souhaitais partager avec vous des bonnes pratiques ici à Madagascar. 
et je vous remercie donc de l'espace qui nous a été donné. Un grand merci, lieutenant-colonel Fali. Merci pour ces exemples très concrets et aussi d'entendre la collaboration entre, entre les pays. Et c'est aussi ce à quoi vous, nous souhaitons être associés, l'échange et, et le but de ce, de, de ce side event. So I'm going to shift to English and now welcome. Um, our... Uh, so I'm, I'm asking um, Saline Koube, uh, the woman coordinator, the coordinator of the Women's Network in Zimbabwe, to turn her camera and to be with us. So Sally is going to share with her her experience and her perspective on the role of national and civil society organizations that are working on gender equality and on GBV prevention and response. So Sally, what, what are the, the opportunities for women civil society organizations to influence disaster risk management at national, but also at subnational level? And how have they, have they been included in, uh, in Zimbabwe? Over to you, Sally. And I, Sally, are you still here? I can't see Sally. I think okay. Dropped off. Maybe we can move on to Maurice. So, Maurice, yes. <laughs> Maybe Maurice, you can go next then. Uh, Maurice Tayeba is uh, calling us from Tanzania and representing the East African community. He's a children and youth expert. And Maurice, um, if you're ready, <laughs> sorry for that. We would like you to speak on the role of regional bodies in gender responsive DRM and how you are helping member states, uh, ESC member states to, to use you as ESC, but also to, to develop national gender responsive DRM. Over to you, Maurice. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and I'm very happy to be invited uh to speak on behalf of the esc and greetings to everyone attending from arusha where we have the secretariat of the east african community and uh for those who don't know the east african community is a regional intergovernmental organization for six countries uh, uganda kenya uh, tanzania uh, burundi rwanda and south sudan and our secretariat is in Arusha. Uh, we also have the Court of Justice based in Arusha and the Legislative Assembly, which is a regional parliament also uh, in Arusha. Uh, but beyond that, we have different uh, ministries responsible for ESC affairs in the rest of the member countries. And uh, this question is actually pertinent uh, because the ESC uh, is only as strong as its partner states. All uh, implementation happens uh, at national level. And um, our role as the regional body is to make sure that we set standards, uh, work uh, with the different international agencies uh, to develop the agenda that partner states follow. Uh, we also look at cross-border issues, especially what we are talking about today issues such as uh, climate change, disasters. And then we also do monitoring of the commitments that countries have made to their citizens through national constitutions, but also through, to, through other treaty and legislative instruments at regional and international level. So that's our role. Uh, when we come in, we come in uh, uh, to only augment what countries have agreed Read to do. And we don't set the agenda, they set the agenda by themselves. And through the Council of Ministers, which is an organ that sets the agenda. And uh, sometimes through the Summit of Heads of State, we implement that way. So related to disaster risk reduction and management, um, and also gender and GBV, we have two units at the ESC Secretariat. One that deals with the environment, natural resources, and climate change. And we also have the gender 
uh, gender department, which also deals with children, youth, persons with disabilities, social protection, and community development. Uh, so those two units collaborate together to drive this um, agenda on disaster risk reduction and management, uh, including uh, the gender perspectives of uh, the DRR stroke M. And so um, we have strategies and we have the gender policy. The gender policy has a specific section which looks at uh, environmental issues, natural, natural disasters, and also other issues. For example, what we are facing right now, the pandemics and uh, what people, some people call the forces of nature. And then uh, it looks at definitely the gender lenses, uh, who is affected, uh, the responses, and uh, it's based on, on principles such as uh, risk assessments, uh, appraisals, and also interventions that involve men and women, knowing that the relationships between men and women, especially in communities, are very important. When you go to the communities, you'll find while the biggest, um, the most affected people will be women and children, but the people who take decisions, for example, on land, uh, and if you were to do any climate change or uh, sustainable approaches within the communities, you may need to talk to, to the men. So for us, these gender relations are very important uh, while looking at uh, definitely particular issues concerning the empowerment of women, because we know women come from a different uh, background than men in terms of control, decision-making. So the gender policy looks at all those areas. And the, we also have the disaster risk management strategy, which was developed in 2016, I mean, in 2012 and reviewed in 2016. And it also looks at uh, different risk factors uh, and promotion of particular uh, disaster risk uh, reduction and management um, approaches and in response and uh, preparedness uh, programs within the different countries. So um, uh, when I bring it home to exactly what we are doing to implement these policies, uh, for us as the beyond the gender uh, policy uh, from the gender department, we've developed the gender action plan. And right now we're implementing the gender action plan. Uh, we have technical working groups with uh, different uh, countries, which are composed of members from the different countries. We have a gender, and gender women empowerment and development technical working group. This looks at general issues of uh, that relate to women empowerment, gender equality, equity, and then uh, sustainable development. But uh, we have also formed a GBV working group, which is general. It involves governments, stakeholders, academia. We also have civil society organizations. In fact, this is civil society led. We work the, with the East African Civil Society Organizations Forum, and uh, they are the ones who drive the agenda and bring governments together. As I speak, we are organizing the 16 days of uh, GBV activism, uh, which we shall then uh, uh, culminate in uh, celebration of the Human Rights Day on December 10th. And we are working with the YAKSOF to make sure that we bring together this uh, gender GBV working group, which we just formed last year uh, during the COVID time, uh, to meet for the first time in Mombasa. So. Uh, we are planning to meet the GBV working group. Uh, the meeting will be both physical and virtual so that we can have as many people, especially from the civil society and other stakeholders as possible. And so that's how we work. And that's how we work with countries uh, because most of these civil society organizations have different relationships with governments. And when you go to civil society organizations, they are even quite advanced in mobilizing resources, uh, and so they are huge um, uh, partners, not only for us as the Secretariat, but for the member states as well. Then when it comes to the climate change um, and um, uh, environment unit, they have developed a COVID-19 response plan, 
which is quite broad because it looks at supporting agricultural development, environment and natural resources management, and enhancing gender inclusiveness for improved livelihoods. So uh, that's actually the title of the, uh, the response plan. So you can see it has all uh, broad-based approaches and this response plan has been uh, shared with countries and for us as the secretariat, we will make sure that the countries domesticate it and uh, build upon it to augment their national plans of action, uh, not only to respond to COVID-19, but also to take forward uh, the, the climate change commitments uh, and also the disaster risk reduction uh, programs that they may have uh, uh, different countries. As you know, disasters don't respect borders. They don't know borders. And we are in a region which is affected by many disasters. If there are not landslides, there will be floods. If there are not floods, there will be locusts. If there are not locusts, there will be diseases. So really, for us as a regional body, is we make sure that we constantly have uh, conversations with political leaders, technical leaders, to make sure we have uh, a, a harmonized agenda, not only for one country, but for all the six partner states. Again, knowing that the six partner states also have different contexts. So um, we also uh, will have a legislative assembly, as I mentioned, and the IALA, uh, the East African Legislative Assembly has ha considered an ESC disaster risk reduction and management bill in 2014, but unfortunately it was not passed. So this is one area which we need to revisit to make sure that uh, this bill passes. Also uh, the ESC climate change bill, uh, which was also discussed. We need to make sure that these bills are passed into acts of law and are implemented. And I think way back in 2014, 15 and 16, there was a talk of a climate change fund uh, to augment all the commitments that are usually made in the climate change conferences. I know the COP has just ended. There were so many um, commitments made, not only by, the, by the, the first world countries, but also our, our own member states. So, we tend to go to, to these negotiations together as a bloc, and that's how we support member countries. So I'm concluding by giving a few recommendations on what we can do together as partners, and uh, not only support member countries, but if they are member countries and governments attending on how they can, for example, look at the important role civil societies play because they are the stakeholders, they are the people with the hands that reach communities. So we hope that we can together develop early warning systems because usually we find that this is a big challenge. And being at regional level, if we have regional best early warning systems, not only for normal disasters, but also issues like drought, floods, then that would be very important. And obviously looking at all the gender uh, issues that uh, we usually leave behind. Then we also look at strengthening the work with, with uh, partners, especially in strengthening governance structures. That means uh, developing gender sensitive strategies, uh, risk reduction, mainstreaming gender in climate change advocacy and risk reduction strategies. Uh, gender developing gender gender sensitive um, uh, uh, disaster climate gender and uh, disaster sensitive um, tools, uh, especially when to, when we go to research and generating evidence, because sometimes people may not see, for example, the important role of women in some of the disaster risk reduction uh, approaches. So we need to generate evidence, develop research, uh, manage knowledge better, and definitely do the sensitization with communities and stakeholders. And then definitely what I talked about uh, uh, at the ESC level, to make sure we support partner states to uh, finalize the disaster risks reduction bill, the climate change bill, and maybe work together to, to 
to finalize and implement the climate change fund. So I'll stop there. I hope I've used my time well, and I thank you for listening to me. And uh, we can continue engaging. And as Emmanuel assured us, this is just the beginning. We are always there. I will share my contacts and the contacts of the ESC Secretariat so that we engage more. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope to listen to more insightful conversations as we go along. Over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Maurice, and thanks also for stressing uh, the role of uh, the civil society organizations, of women civil society organization, uh, and great to know that you have this EAC civil society forum. Uh, we were in contact with Sally. She's trying to reconnect us uh, through the phone. She was in the waiting rooms, so I'm hoping IT let her in. Um, participant, I'm just asking a bit of your patience. Um, Dorobin, could you make sure she's in? My colleague, Catherine. I don't yes, see her. Sally now in the room. You let her. So Sally, are you on? I don't see her connected. No, so what I suggest just to, we have a few minutes left. Um, maybe um, Anna, we have a Mantipole. Uh, colleagues, so we want also to take advantage to have all of you together uh, to get also your support on identifying the next steps and especially in identifying where do we think we need to uh, put our effort, especially in terms of capacity uh, strengthening. So in the chat, you have a link uh, to a Mentipole, so you can click on it um, and you can um, answer there is very uh, short and few questions. While we wait that maybe Sally will connect. And yes, she is actually. So while you're doing the Mantipole, Sally, thanks for all your efforts to rejoin us. I'm not sure if you can turn your camera, but if you can, you're welcome to do it. Otherwise, the floor is yours to share, you know, how women civil society organizations are involved at national and subnational level in Zimbabwe. Over to you, Sally. Thank you, Emanuele, and thank you, everyone. Apologies for the connections hiccup. Uh, so when we look, uh, I also want to appreciate this platform for it gives us an opportunity to share, to link, to learn, and contribute to strengthening gender responsive disaster, re disaster uh, risk management at community, national, regional, and international level. So women's rights and gender organizations and activists and community-based groups have been responding to disasters since time immemorial. Unfortunately, they have been doing the unrecognized work and they have done that with minimum support. Moving on to the current circumstances, sharing the experience from Zimbabwe, for example, the role of women's rights organizations, gender and community-based groups have really been around in a rapid situation analysis. So the role have been to do a context analysis on who is affected, what is going on, what are the nuances and the, and the dynamics of uh, the disaster as it unfolds. So the preliminary rapid gender responsive, uh, gender response or gender situation analysis have been done and it have been a consistent ongoing assessment uh, even in the planning of the response, implementation, oversight of response actors, as well as the influencing or advocacy around the recovery uh, in supporting communities to be resilient post uh, the disaster situations. The other role have been around response planning. So women's rights organizations and activists and groups are not a homogeneous group. They have different expertise and they are also positioned in different parts of the country at subnational level, at community level and, uh, and at national level. So the planning has really been around deploying the expertise based on the need at, from community to national level. Uh, so that we have seen a lot of coordination happening at community-based level using the community champions uh, and cadres. Then the capacity strengthening because each disaster as it unfolds come in with its different dynamics. Uh, so we have seen uh, the expertise that women's movement over the period, over, over time immemorial have built in expertise on capacity strengthening tools, uh, approaches, methodologies of the doing no harm in any uh, disaster response mechanism. 
Then the issue of response implementation oversight. We have seen women's rights organization and gender organizations and community-based groups and champions also taking a lead in ensuring that there is gender responsiveness oversight in terms of how the disaster response is being implemented, how it is structured, the issue of budgeting, gender responsive budgeting, uh, how resources are allocated, accounted for uh, the issues of transparency and issues around prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse in the development of aid or any intervention support mechanism. The other support, uh, the other role have been around conflict, conflict prevention and management. So one of the conflict that came into mind was my, our experience when we, when UNICEF was supporting the cholera epidemic. There were community conflicts around the political leadership not being able to work with their constituencies uh, to respond to the emergency of the time. Uh, and there were also household based uh, conflicts among relatives based on our social norms, uh, religious practices, uh, family relations. So we have seen women's rights organizations stepping up to facilitate platforms and uh, mediate where conflicts were, were there. And then in support recovery, there have been also issues around how do we build better together in a manner that is gender responsive, that preserves and observes the rights of people and the dignity of women, girls, men and women, uh, you know, as well as boys and men in, in affected communities. So some of the roles have been really around support recovery. And in terms of the opportunities, we have seen that women's rights organizations and activists and gender groups, they have the community presence, they have the contacts, the networks, the indigenous knowledge system of how they have navigated the dynamics or complexities of uh, sometimes how responses are um, affected by political dynamics of various communities. We have also seen provision uh, of technical expertise. So there's an opportunity that um, the technical expertise, experiences, contact networks, and already mobilized and engaged community resources uh, in terms of people who are connected to the affected and them having knowledge of the vulnerable population or vulnerable communities and categories of groups. Uh, there are also issues around the intersectionalities of uh, women, uh, men, boys and girls uh, in various affected communities. So women's rights organizations role uh, or an opportunity for partnership will be around uh, supporting already existing mechanism to strengthen the gender responsiveness that do exist. Uh, the nature of uh, disaster response have also been uh, militarized or having security sector driven. So in the emergency of saving lives uh, versus the dignity and the rights of people, we have seen that um, how our security sector is trained, deployed, or supported to enforce uh, regulations for safeguarding uh, communities during disaster situations, it has not been rights responsive or gender responsive. Um, so there have been uh, expertise or works at small scale level of trying to ensure that the enforcement of uh, regulations, mechanisms, or any form of national driven that is that involves the security sector. There's need for capacity strengthening on rights-based approach. There's also need for oversight and, and uh, deploying uh, gender expertise. Some of the lessons learned were that when we look at our structures responsible for gender, uh, responsible for disaster risk management, they are not, uh, they do not have gender representation. And even in terms of the thematic areas that are assigned to particular committees or working groups, there is an absent, uh, there's a glaring absence of a gender expertise. So some of the recommendation is to ensure that all structures that have to do with disaster risk um, management, response and recovery, there be a standing um, expertise that is on the, on the table. We had uh, some advocacy work uh, here in Zimbabwe and would hear some of the pushback to say, but there are women who are experts who are in the committees. So it's not just about the numbers of women or those that identify with any gender of uh, that they choose, but it's about having an expertise or a person who has roles and responsibilities to ensure that gender responsiveness by policy, practice, resource allocation, accountability mechanisms, and tracking to learn because when we talk about gender responsive, um, uh, gender responsiveness in disaster, in disaster risk management, it's not static. Gender dynamics shift. 
So there is a need for us to ensure that the structures have a standing uh, role, responsibility or duty bearer who can be held to account and ensure that their expertise is supported. The other issue is around ensuring that the enforcement mechanism by deployment, by methodology, by approaches, are strengthened in capacity on gender responsiveness, and they are also held to account where there is gender discrimination uh, and also violation of rights thereof. Then looking into the issue of dignity, uh, preserving the dignity of survivors or those that are affected by different forms of disasters, we also learned that the dignity kits are not standardized. They are different and they also vary. So some of our recommendations include the standardization of a minimum package of a dignity pack that is informed through consultation of communities. So, so that there is uh, engagement of diverse uh, or involvement of ensuring that disaster risk management is gender responsive. Lastly, there are harmful practices in response where we then look into there is no, there is a saving life mode and saying we don't do gender, we are saving lives. So saving lives in a manner that is not gender responsive uh, will actually harm us more. So the harmful practices of always putting, no, we are not doing gender, we are saving lives. It's uh, something that we are recommending for us to transform. So we have seen lastly that there are no platforms for always reviewing like this platform to say, how are we faring? How are we performing? What are some of the gains? What are the learnings? How do we also tap into indigenous knowledge systems? And how do we support women's rights organizations and communities? Because whether there's a project or not, whether there's funding or not, they are responding and they have gained expertise. So our role is to build on that expertise and support them. Then there are long-term recommendations around for any response to happen, there is some logistics that have to happen. There is an infrastructure that is enabling that needs to be put in place. We have seen quite a number of um, community, national, regional, and international hiccups coming just from purely transport logistics. So a deliberate investment from our continuous learning on a gender responsive infrastructure mechanism and logistics mechanism and resourcing is something that I would lastly share as a recommendation. Thank you and over to you, Emanuela. Wonderful, Sally. I'm so glad you were able to rejoin us. Uh, thanks for this very powerful statement uh, for you know, acknowledging the role of women in, in mediating the conflict. Also on noting that on disaster response, like the, the workforce is really security forces most of the time, and we need to consider that. But I really appreciate when you said, you know, it's not the number of women. This is really the role and the responsibilities we are giving them. Uh, and as you said, you know, even if there is no funding or no project, the women are responding anyway. So that was uh, beautifully said. And I think that's a great way to end uh, our side event. We passed the hour. Thanks for all the participants to stay with us. We'll follow up with you with, uh, with the report. Please disseminate. I want to thank um, my colleague from IFRC, Milanoi. Also, Anna, who has been really the lead author of the report and has put us to, together throughout. Um, a big thanks to Lieutenant Colonel Fali, to Maurice. And um, we count on all of you who have connected uh, to continue to help us to center gender in disaster risk reductions, but also on climate change adaptation. So enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference. Thank you.